all of you for our vigil and forum for racial justice. I'm Teresa ladrigan Wilkley. I'm our Vice President for Mission Integration here at Salve. And we would like to record this vigil and forum for racial justice today. Today is June 5th. Today is the birthday of Brianna Taylor. Today would have been Brianna's 27th birthday. So we gather today to hold vigil for Brianna Taylor. Mahmoud Arbery and George Floyd and so many, many more people of color who have been killed due to racialized violence, systemic racism. This week, many have been reflecting and in preparation for today, three students from our Black Students Union submitted the following intentions for our vigil and forum. So let us begin by hearing their words. We pray that those who cannot understand on a personal level find the courage to speak up and help make change on campus and in their communities. End quote. Quote, as a student of color, I appreciate what Salve is trying to do by keeping myself and other students of color in their prayers. I hope that one day all we'll have fought for will be worth it. And we can all finally live as one with equity and equality. End quote. Quote, we didn't get brought out all this way for us to be left out in the dirt to rot. We've stuck together all this way and we fought our own battles all this way. It will be a shame for us to think that this is the end or there is no hope. This is another obstacle we need to climb. Things will change. Pope Francis this week reflected that we cannot turn a blind eye to racism and yet claim to defend the sacredness of every human life. The US Catholic Bishop shared that racism is not simply a throwaway political issue. It's a real and present danger that must be met head on. At Salve Regina University, our Mercy Catholic mission, our commitment to the critical concerns, our commitment to the dignity of every human life, calls me, calls us, to become an actively anti-racist institution. Today, our program will consist of two main parts. The first portion is a prayer vigil, inviting us to come together as a Salve community to hold in our hearts and our prayers all who've been killed and all who suffer due to systemic racial injustice. To keep vigil is to keep watch, to stay awake and bear a light in the darkness. And this first, first portion of our program will gather to pray, to remember, and to commit. In the second part of our program, we'll host a forum, hearing from members of our Salve community, students, recent graduates, staff, faculty, around issues of racial justice and injustice impacting our lives on campus and our communities. And we'll also hear from our president, Dr. Kelly Armstrong, as we consider actions we can take as an institution 
and recommit to taking to address the critical concerns of racism and nonviolence as a community. To begin our program, Malcolm Smith, our Vice President for Student Affairs, will offer the opening. Malcolm. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to welcome all the students, faculty, staff, and administration. And uh, while we are saddened by the need for this vigil, we're truly thankful for your presence with us in this space. Additionally, as Teresa said, we will engage in a forum for racial justice today in an, in an ongoing fashion. For that, I am also thankful. As our community needs to explore these important issues together, if we were ever going to move forward together. We must engage in the practice of accepting the reality for the black community in this nation. Listen to and believe the stories of people affected by racial injustice. And further, I challenge, I challenge the allies in this virtual room and beyond to engage in educating yourselves, your friends, your families, and your broader communities about the seriousness of racial injustice in the United States. Some of you may be wondering why there's a call to action for the white community around racial justice, and I'm going to tell you point blank why that is occurring. It is because we know that if black people could put an end to racial justice and white supremacy, it would have ended hundreds of years ago. <clears throat> the black community has always been incredibly active in the efforts to end racial injustice, and we will continue to be. But teaching everyone about it is not our responsibility. People always learn more when they're invested in the subject. The black community cannot make people interested. Only you can do that for yourselves. Once that becomes more widespread, we will make far more progress. And for those of you who believe we've come a long way in this country, I say to you that we are here today because a black man was lynched on the street, on camera, in broad daylight, just over a week ago. George Floyd is not alone. He just happens to be one of the most recent displays of police brutality and racial injustice in this country. He just happens to be the latest hashtag. There are far too many hashtags. I feel compelled to remind us that in regards to police brutality in this country, the bottom line request from the black community is to be treated like a human being. And that's in regards to all racial injustice a human with dignity, a human with rights, a human who is a son, daughter, mother, father, brother, sister. A human is loved by many who do not deserve to die <clears throat> due to a confrontation with the very people who are sworn to serve and protect us all. Don't get me wrong, there are many issues at hand in the nation when it comes to the black community. There are a number of disparities that need attention health disparities, education, housing, wealth, employment. We cannot rest, as it is often said, eternal vigilance is the price for freedom. This will not be an overnight success. This fight will continue for many years and decades to come. I refuse to deceive myself, deceive myself or any of you into thinking that this country will wake up tomorrow and suddenly be racially just. We have a 400 year history of racial injustice. It is deeply woven into the fabric of this country. And until we can explore that history without defensiveness and aggression, it will continue. Until we are unable to hear from one another that this country may be fundamentally flawed and not take that statement as a personal slight to your character, it will continue. Until we can examine our own biases without lashing out at each other due to our own fear of being judged for those biases, Racial injustice will continue. Until we have reform in our communities, it will continue. And if we relax, racial injustice will continue for future generations. So what should we do? A message um, for just individual black people, and I, and I want to include people of color in this because I know that while our struggles may be different, our histories may be different, there's a great deal of overlap that is important as the uniqueness of our struggles. But 
this message is to young black people and their allies and their friends, but dear black people, please take time, the time you need for yourself. This is heavy. Um, I've cried every day for the last two weeks. Most days, multiple times. Um, As a community and as individuals, we feel angry, sad, frustrated, numb, exhausted. All of that is perfectly natural when you see your brothers and sisters dying on screen regularly. Be patient with yourself. Take breaks as needed. And when you are ready, dig back into the work. Research and understand the movements dedicated to the cause of racial injustice across this nation. Engage in the movement that speaks to your heart. Understand and engage in the Black business community. Most importantly, practice self-care. You are not a superhero, nor do you need to act like one. We all have certain levels of bandwidth. Understand yours and be kind to yourself. To the allies, teach yourselves, teach your loved ones, call out racial injustice when you witness it. Do the things you feel are important and that you are comfortable doing. As you educate yourself, you become more comfortable doing more because you will become more uncomfortable with what is happening in this country. Again, you also should take care of yourselves. This work is not easy and it is ongoing. Be patient with yourselves. Learning this is heavy. Learning to act upon your knowledge is heavier. But I ask you to always remember, if you are tired of learning about racism, think about those of us who deal with its effects every day. Again, I leave you with this. The Black community is not asking for special treatment. We are asking for equal treatment. We want to live free and not die because of the level of melanin in our skin. We are your neighbors, your community partners, your fellow countrymen. It really is that simple. We ask that you see the Black community as human and treat us that way. To the students specifically, I'm here for you. I see you. I feel you. More than that, I understand what you are feeling. Please use me as a resource and let me know what I can do to help. You are the most important generation in this fight. You are teaching the older generations and you are, pop and you are the population that is setting the tone for future generations. Therefore, what you decide to learn and how you challenge yourselves and one another to continue to step outside of your comfort zones and to continue the fight is incredibly important. All 50 states are involved in this current movement towards justice, as well as a number of other countries. That has never happened before. Take a full advantage of the stage that has been presented. Also, have faith in South. I truly believe that this is a community that wants to be the best it can be. I truly believe that the leadership of this institution is dedicated to making strides for racial justice. Thank you for your dedication, President Armstrong. I believe in our mission statement and the critical concerns of mercy. But also know that I believe that even a good community must learn, must grow, and must be held accountable. I appreciate you hearing what I had to say and I thank you for considering my words. Dr. Landrigan, well, please, I'll give it back to you. Thank you, Malcolm. We will begin now our prayer vigil together. When Janetta Bryant saw the footage of Mr. George Floyd into the sidewalk, under the knee of former officer Derek Chauvin and heard him cry out for his mother. She said it hit her as a black mother in a very deep way. She said, so I went into meditation because I needed understanding and I needed strength. She felt the need to be able to give her son wisdom and to help him be able to live and to be confident in the world. So she wrote lyrics 
to what we are going to hear and gave them to her son, Kidron. During a daily devotional period, Kidron meditated on those words his mother had given to him and recorded this song. Our call to prayer today is sung by 12-year-old Kidron Bryant, I Just Want to Live. I'm a young black man doing all that I can to stay. Oh, but when I look around and I see what's being done to my kind every day, I'm being hunted as prey. My people don't want no trouble. We've got an old strong goal. I just want to live. God protect me. I just want to live. I just want to live. Dear God, efforts to dismantle racism, we understand that we struggle not merely against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, institutions and systems that keep racism alive by perpetuating the lie that some members of our family are inferior and others superior. Create in us a new mind and heart that will enable us to see brothers and sisters in the faces of those divided by racial categories. Give us the grace and strength to rid ourselves and our institutions of practices of racial injustice that oppress some of us while providing entitlements to others. Help us to create a church and a nation and a world that embraces the hopes and fears of oppressed people of color where we live, as well as those in distant lands. Heal your family, God, and make us one with you, in union with our brother Jesus and empowered by your Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from the letter, from the first letter of St. John. Beloved, I am writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new commandment that is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says, I am in the light, while hating a brother or sister, is still in the darkness. Whoever loves a brother or sister lives in the light, and, and in such a person, there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates another believer is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, and does not know the way to go, because the darkness has brought on blindness. The word of the Lord. We mourn the loss of our brothers and sisters who have died due to systemic racial injustice. We say their names. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Michael Brown, John Crawford, Walter Scott, Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray, Samuel DeBose, Trayvon Martin, Orlando Castile, Deborah Danner, Alteria Woods, Atatiana Jefferson, Alton Sterling, and so many more. We raise their lives and their stories, their families and their communities to you. We are their community. Black Lives Matter.
I have, in many ways, thought about what I would say today. And I really think that racism and injustice is something that you and I really have to deeply think about. In my, in my ministry, I was stationed at St. Michael's in Providence which is probably one of the toughest neighborhoods in the state of Rhode Island. It's multi-ethnic. At the parish, we had mass in five different languages every Sunday. But the thing that was so important was, how did I feel about that? When I was walking in the evening, which I did often, I saw a black person approach me what happened inside of me? Now, I would definitely say that I'm not racist, and I would say that then. But was there something that kind of stirred inside me that wouldn't have if a white person was passing me? I had to look at that, and I had to think about that, and I had to do something about that. And it took a while, and it took my, it took me just looking at myself and thinking about why do why does that happen? Why do I do that? And it was something that was inside of me, but as soon as I realized it, it was something that I could do something about. That was probably in the first few months of my time at St. Michael's. I spent 25 years there, 25 best years of my ministry. I got to share in the spirituality of people who were of all different ethnic backgrounds. Each one had a gift to give to me. And I hope I had a gift to give to them. But they taught me, I always have to look inside. I always have to realize exactly what's going on in me. Maybe not so much in my mind, because I can say that. But what's deep down inside of me, the feelings that I have, if we look at that and can address that, I think we can be freer, we can be better, if we can understand what we are called to as a church. Going to Salve, you have a fine example in your teachers, in the president, in people who truly try to live the values of Catherine Macaulay, the foundress of the Sisters of Mercy. It's a great privilege to be here with you. And that's what I need to share today. What's deep inside of us? And how do we deal with what's inside? May God give you peace. Let's take a moment in light of the sin of racism to examine our consciences, asking ourselves, have I fully loved God and fully loved my neighbor as myself? Have I caused pain to others by my actions, my words, or my silence, disregarding the full human dignity of my brother or sister? Have I informed myself about the sin of racism? its roots and all its contemporary manifestations? Have I opened my eyes and my heart to the reality of systemic racism to see how it impacts the life and dignity of all my brothers and sisters every day? Have I ever witnessed racism and failed to speak or act? Have I ever inflicted the pain of racism on another? Have I ever confronted racism, offering God's love to a brother or sister who is being dehumanized? What am I doing to heal the wounds of racism? What am I called to do?
First, they came for the people who had special needs. I did not speak out because I don't have any special needs. They, they came for the Jewish people, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for those who were Middle Eastern, but I did not speak out because I am not Middle Eastern. Then they came for the Asians, but I did not speak out because I am not Asian. Then they came for those that were transgender, and I did not speak out because I was not transgender. Then they came for those with physical disabilities, and I did not speak out because I am not physically disabled. And then they came for those who are mixed race, and I did not speak out because I am not mixed race. Then they came for those who are black, and I did not speak out because I am not black. Then they came for the Muslims, and I did not speak out because I'm not Muslim. And then they came for those who had financial struggles, but I did not speak out because I did not feel these struggles. Then they came for the homosexual, and I did not speak out because I'm not homosexual. Then they came for Native Americans, and I did not speak out because I was not Native American. Then they came for those who were overweight, but I did not speak out because I am not overweight. And then they came for those who were immigrants, and I did not speak out because I'm not an immigrant. And then they came for me, and by that time there was no one else to speak for me. Let us affirm together in this pledge for action. We pledge to, to examine our own, own biases, biases positions, positions of privilege through self-reflection, and earnestly, earnestly work to, to resolve them. We will do this for We pledge to live by compassion and mercy and be consciously inclusive of all individuals we will, we will do this work. work. We pledge to promote understanding, equity, and mutual respect, affirming the full life and dignity of every human person. We will, we will do, do this, this work. work. We pledge to transform our institutions into authentically anti-racist and anti-oppressive communities of action. We will, we will do this work. work. We pledge to advocate for justice, demanding equal opportunity for all and speaking out, helping to create a beloved community for everyone to share. We will do this work. Amen. Let it be so. Thank you for joining us in this vigil in racial justice, this prayer, and this commitment. And now we like to turn to the reflections of our Salve community to enter a forum together, Community Forum on Racial Justice. And we will invite Shakita Baylor to begin. Thank you, Teresa. So to come up with this reflection on what's happening in the world today was very hard because I've experienced so many mixed emotions over the last few weeks. One day I'm scared because I'm unsure if my partner who has found himself followed by the police and randomly stopped here on this island so many times, we'll make it back home safely. Or just thinking and ask yourself, how many times have you been stopped by the police on a Quicknick Island and asked why you're here or if you live here? For him, it's been more times than he can count on one hand and sometimes by the same officer. But I'm not just scared for him. I'm scared for my dad, my cousins. I'm scared for Drew Andrews, Cam Collins, Donnie, Josh, 
Spiffy, Malcolm, and all of the other black men on this campus. But shortly that fear turns to anger because I can't understand why for 400 years, black people in the United States has been systematically oppressed, threatened and treated poorly. Why? Why me? What did I ever do for people to hate me? And through all of the education that I've had, I can't seem to understand the fear and the hatred some Americans have for me and my family. Like yours, my family are God-loving, God-fearing people. Why well, hate them? And so I find myself crying and praying because I don't understand why this is happening. And, and I want it all just to stop. I want the hate to stop. I want the anger to stop. I want the oppression, the discrimination, and the marginalization just to stop. And I know it won't bring back Georgia, Brianna, and the many others, but I, I don't want to lose any more innocent Black people. And I definitely don't want to lose any from our campus. The other day, I just needed it all to stop. So I cut off the TV and I decided to listen to someone who made sense during this time. And I found myself listening to Dr. Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail. I would encourage you all to read or listen to it. I found it on YouTube and I listened to it while washing dishes. But it was a very fitting letter for what we're experiencing today. And I couldn't believe that that letter was written 57 years ago. And the world still hasn't changed much at all. In his letter from jail, he wrote, oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. The yearning for freedom eventually manifests itself, and that is what happened to the American Negro. The Negro has many pent up resentments and latent frustrations, and he must release them. So let him march, let him make prayer pilgrimages to the city, let him go on freedom rides, and try to understand why he must do so. If his repression, repressed emotions, are not released in a nonviolent way, they will seek expression through violence. This is not a threat, but a fact of history. I ask that the Salve community try to understand why this time and experience is painful for Black people. To understand this, I encourage you to educate yourself on Black history and systems of oppression. You have the time because you can't go anywhere. So here's the thing. Do not ask your black friends or your professors to teach you because they may be emotionally tired. These are things that you can teach yourself. I am happy to recommend things for you to listen to and read or resources, but you have to do the work. Listen to the hurt and pain of this community, my community and what they're expressing. Continue to have courageous conversations at home and in the classroom. Protest right alongside of us. This is not just a black and brown problem. It's a problem for all of us. Dr. King said in that same letter, injustice anywhere is a threat for, a threat for justice everywhere. And Ellie Wiesel reminds us that there may be times when we are powerless to prevent injustice, but there must never be a time that we fail to protest. And I know change is hard and learning new things is even harder. However, as members of this Salve community, we can never say it's not our problem. Our founders, the Sisters of Mercy, never say it's not our problem. It is our mission, it is our duty on this campus to learn, lead, and make a difference and to fight for a world that's harmonious, just, and merciful. It is our time, Salve, and it's our time to live up to this. Thank you. I would like to pass it on to um, Izzy Sullivan, our SGA president, to provide her reflection. Hello, can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, so I wrote some notes down. Please forgive me if I look down at my paper. I don't mean to be rude. Um, but good morning, everybody. Uh, during these extenuating circumstances, everyone is staying safe and healthy, Lord willing. Um, as I've gathered my thoughts over the past
past couple of days and weeks, I've really found myself sitting and thinking in silence. Social media has become an outlet for me to become an activist and voice my opinions and beliefs for others to see. And as each growing day passes, not just in the past couple of weeks, but in the past couple of years, I have realized more and more that posting a picture or liking a video isn't enough. Now, don't get me wrong, posting an image or video on any social media platform has never been enough. I'm a firm believer that words without action mean nothing. But lately it seems like nothing we do is enough. And this feeling is heartbreaking, at least to me. I say this because this feeling has num of numbness has really consumed my heart. Numbness in the sense that the events and atrocities and murders and the racism and the systemic and systematic and institutional oppression and discrimination that are really being brought to light right now is not new. African Americans, Latinos, Hispanics, and other people of color not mentioned have been murdered, discriminated against, and oppressed long before the riots and protests started. So what hurts my heart and my soul and my mind the most is that those people, those allies, even some people of color who are acting, conducting themselves in such a way as if the developments, developments of these past weeks and months are new occurrences. I'm sad to say that Sal Regine University, an institution where one of the founding and most critical aspects of our mission is anti-racism, we often fall into the pool of complacency and self-chosen ignorance. Though this does not go for everyone at Salve, staff, students, faculty, administration alike, we are only as strong as our weakest link. I leave you with this. As a paying member, um, a person of color, a student leader, and above all else, a student, I challenge Salve to do better. There are pieces in place that need to be completed and moved in order to finish a bigger picture. As a diversity initiative was passed a year ago now and close to nothing has been done about it. I find it ridiculous to wrap my head around the fact that we have so many incredible, intelligent and talented community members that can't seem to come up with a decision about a resolution to benefit and equip the future of this world. We need to stop being divided and come together. After doing some research, I found that Salve is part of a conference called the Conference of Mercy Higher Education. And of these 17 institutions involved, only six of them have a diversity statement separate from their mission statement. A statement that has them upholding and creating a campus community that is against racism, discrimination, and the oppression of all community members. Salve is not among the six institutions to hold a diversity mission statement. It is not enough to simply say one of our core values is a fight against racism if we do nothing to support it. This is my challenge to you, to us, and maybe then students won't come to me rethinking them attending Salve in the fall and be fearful because they believe wholeheartedly Salve will not support them. Thank you. I would like to now hand this over to the Assistant Director of the Multicultural and Retention Office, Rose Albert. Thank you, um, Easy. What a horrific time we are living in. Two extremes are happening in this country and in this world. On the one hand, we have a pandemic taking away people's ability to breathe. On the other, we have the continuation of the desecration of black bodies, most recently the murder of George Floyd. I feel like people are forgetting this fact. It is a fact that there is a worldwide pandemic. It is a fact that black people in the US are continuing to be lynched. That is our reality, my reality. So I wonder, where was the mercy for George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Pamela Turner, and so many others? There's so much to unpack, but I do not have that time today. And I also cannot be the one to teach non-allies the racist history that plagues our society but I do encourage them to self-educate 
for the betterment of our society and our South community. I want to take a moment to address, to address those people that look like me, my Black brothers and sisters who, as some already spoken, are feeling powerless, frustrated, scared, and not safe. You're not alone. I see your pain. I feel your pain. Our emotions are valid. And let's not forget the rest of the Salve community. I invite you to take time and listen to us and support us. Realize that your community is hurting because when a portion of this community is under attack, we are all under attack. Right now, it is not the time to sit silently and claim neutrality. Right now, we ask that you name the wrong, acknowledge the injustice, and take action. If the growth of diversity is truly a goal of ours at Salve, we need to address it. There needs to be a structural change at Salve Regina University. As a community following the Mercy mission, we must implement a culture of involvement and anti-racist workshop, identity work, LGBTQIA plus issues, and embrace the various cultures we have on campus. Salve needs to have a zero tolerance policy when it comes to discrimination cases. Racism, macro, microaggressive behaviors have no place in a harmonious world, and we should not tolerate it on our campus especially not in the classroom. We have a duty to our students to do better, which is why it is imperative that faculty and staff are properly trained to address diversity, equity, race, and all of the isms that create division in our world. Show me where you stand, Salve, because actions speak louder than words. And Easy already made some great points. I am exhausted. I am devastated. And right now, I cannot talk any longer without policy changes. Not without bold statements followed by actions, making it clear that we are all standing with us. We need to know that Salve is committed to making our society better. And right now, we need to take action. Thank you. Um, I would like to introduce a recent Salve alumni, Tim Mentor, class of 2020. Thank you, Rose. Um, what a year, indeed. Um, I, I can't help but echo a lot of what people who have come before me have said about how this year has kind of taken us for twists and turns and tumbles and falls. Um, I think most recently I was very um, taken aback by the idea that there were two viruses in the country, and I really liked that metaphor. Um, and it, it was nice that to think that people are both aware um, of the prevalence of the viruses, both being COVID and racism, um, and as well as the fact that I could all I could almost think that racism was somewhat seasonal. There was always this kind of resurgence every year of outrage. There was this resurgence of um, wanting to protest, of wanting to um, get socially active and, and active on social media as well. Uh, and I was both happy and, and a little um, disappointed by that sometimes because too often I feel that people have their outrage, they have their time, they have their emotions, and then we forget about it and then we stop. And so I think the biggest thing that I've wanted to come out of these protests, that I've wanted to come out of these discussions and these conversations has been that the work is not over when people stop being angry, when people stop um, walking in the streets, when people stop talking about it. 
the work isn't over because if it were, then we wouldn't be having this conversation now. And I think that there isn't an end in sight that doesn't involve a full on confrontation with this um, disease. <laughs> There's no other way um, to think about it, I don't think. Um, and that confrontation isn't going to be easy and that confrontation isn't going to be quick and it won't be something that we can just do. It'll be something that we have to work through. It'll be, it'll be something that we have to discuss and deliberate and argue and debate and also then have a resolution and also then have an understanding. And how do we get there? There are so many questions. There are so many unknowns. There are so many things that we want to say that we want to have happen that we can't just snap our fingers and 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 have it take place. Um, I am graduated this year and I have no clue what I'm going to do. Uh, it's quite a world to uh, to step into, but I I would hopefully encourage that the people use this uncertainty, that they use this energy, they use this emotion to to drive them to work in policy, to work in um, charity, to work in volunteership, to work in um, industries that allow for voices to be heard. I think that this should not only be um, a call to action, but a call to change about how we deal with our day to day lives. And I, I think a lot of people are learning that it's not as difficult as it as people make it out to be to be a good person. Um, it's not as difficult as people make it out to be to be on the right side of history, to make the right decisions, to make the decisions that include people that um, allow people to speak their mind and allow people to to live freely without discrimination. And I, I find it so difficult to speak without emotion. Um, and I, I try to keep a level head in all things that I do, but it's I can't do it now. Um, and so I, I I find myself being careful about how much I talk about it and how much I involve myself and how much I, I show of myself because I I I can't trust um all the things that I'm gonna say and all the things that I'm gonna do. Um I have nothing to say in terms of um you know how I feel. I think it's very apparent. There's no I I think it it's it's a it's a very easy look. If you if you ask somebody of color or somebody who's black, somebody who's African American, how they feel, it's not really a useful question at this point. I think what you should ask is, how have I contributed? How have I participated? How have I um, contributed to change to not change? Um, and as Chiquita mentioned, it's a, it's a personal journey as well as it is a communal journey. Because there's only so much that the community can teach you. Some of it's introspective. A lot of it, the important stuff is introspective. Learn for yourself, think for yourself. Um, and think for yourself in terms of other people as well. I'm reminded of when uh, before we had begun reopening, um, people were on the beach, people were were ne you know neglecting the rules of social distancing, people weren't wearing masks. Um, and that comes from this I this individualistic idea that. If it doesn't bother me, if I don't have an issue with it, then it shouldn't bother other people. And that's the same kind of thinking. That's the same kind of stupid, short minded, narrow minded idea that um, allows for people to believe that there is a difference and there should be a difference in the way that people treat people in this country. Um, I, uh, I hope for the best and I can only promise that I will work for the best. Um, I can only say that I will use all of what I have and all of my emotion to work for something better, um, however that looks like in the future. I think that's all we can do and that's all we have to do. And that's not an easy thing to say. Not It's an easy thing to say, not an easy thing to do. Um, and uh, yeah, so look out for each other, be careful, stay safe. Um, and I hope that we figure out something in my lifetime, at least. I'll pass it over to the man with a, another great name, Tim Neary. Thank you, Tim. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to offer my reflection as a member of the Salve Regina community, as a professor who studies the history of racism in the United States, as the husband of a black woman and as the father of two beautiful interracial children, a son and a daughter. 
Many of you know my wife, Ida Neary, who works at Solve in the Office of International Programs. In the next few minutes, however, I'd like to focus on my 11-year-old son, who is just one week away from completing the fifth grade. And boy, is he ready. <laughs> As uh, I'm sure many of you would agree, college student, professor, parent alike, remote learning certainly has been a challenge. My reflection will be in the form of a letter to him. June 5th, 2020. Dear son, I am writing to you 11 days after the death of George Floyd. Like all human beings, Mr. Floyd was mostly faceted. He was a son, a brother, a father, an athlete in high school, a musician, and most recently, a security guard. In numerous ways, your life is different than his. But the two of you do have one thing in common. The world saw George Floyd as a black man. And in a few short years, the world will see you as a black man. To be black in America is to be part of a noble and proud heritage. West Africans from places like your mother's native Senegal arrived in America before the pilgrims. Despite enslavement, they built this nation, defended it during its every war, and contributed immeasurably, and continue to contribute immeasurably to the economic, social, political, and cultural fabric of its society. As the African-American poet Langston Hughes wrote nearly a century ago, the night is beautiful, so the faces of my people. The stars are beautiful, so the eyes of my people. Beautiful also is the sun. Beautiful also are the souls of my people. Son, you are beautiful. George Floyd was beautiful. But racism is ugly. It is, it is dehumanizing. It is violent. Defeating racism takes knowledge, empathy, and courage. It demands action. It requires sustained commitment. In order to dismantle institutional racism, institutions must change. In seven years, God willing, you will graduate from high school. If you choose to attend Salve Regina University, I want you to feel safe. I want you to feel welcomed. I want you to have access to a curriculum which reflects 
the diversity of the world and equips students to confront and fight against racial inequality. I want an institution that rejects bigotry and stands for justice. My prayer for you, for your sister, for all of us, is that we take seriously the job of defeating racism. There is much work to do. Let us begin. And with that, um, we are now moving to the community forum portion, and I'd like to turn it over to my dear colleague, Professor Robin Hoffman. I hope you know me to be an ally. I care about each and every one of our students. I care about systemic racial injustice and will fight against racism and inequity. I will use my voice to cause positive change. I will try my hardest to ensure a safe community at Salve Regina where all are respected. Black lives matter. Sasha and I will proudly march with you in Salve's fifth Black Lives Matter march. We will join you for an allies dinner where we can continue our conversations and build the relationships that are essential for us to progress as a society. Relationships are powerful. I hear you. I am with you. You are not alone in this battle. I will now read six reflections submitted by current students and recent graduates and attempt to do them justice. As an underrepresented minority, it is immensely disheartening and terrifying to continue to witness and experience racial injustice. I am in disbelief that we have to continue fighting for our rights as human beings in this country. Please realize that our struggles go well beyond politics. They result from police brutality, your implicit biases, and the list goes on. We must acknowledge these causes in order to help solve the root of the problem and create a positive effect. While some people only learn or hear about the facts when they choose to, so many of us have to continually live in this unjust reality. Although you cannot put yourselves in our shoes, I urge you to educate yourselves, educate your families, educate your friends, and continue to peacefully fight for what is right. Ultimately, if you want all lives to matter, then make Black Lives Matter. As a Black woman, I have been traumatized for years because of the brutality my community has faced. Anyone outside of the Black community cannot come to understand how sickening it is to constantly see videos of people who look just like us be murdered because of the color of our skin. I cannot help but imagine myself and my loved ones in similar scenarios, wondering if my time on this earth will be cut short just because someone despises what I look like enough to end my life. It is sad, heartbreaking, difficult. I call the United States of America my home. I have never known anything else and have always had a high standard for myself and being a good citizen. But as I see what's going on around the country, a country I try to be proud in calling my home, it breaks my heart. 
another black individual killed by a law enforcement officer in broad daylight in front of other people who felt powerless due to the uniform these men were wearing. This would have been any other man. I can almost assure you someone would have stepped in. I'm not sure if it was the badge, the gun on their belts, or the uniforms, but the fact these men were policemen had something to do with no one else getting involved. And it is sad. As for me, I am left without many words as to how in the year 2020, we see yet another black man killed by policemen when there was no need to resort to that. It hurts my heart and soul so much, I had to delete Instagram and really try to focus on becoming a stronger individual. So when the time does come to face oppression, I am ready. No, I can never truly know what it is like to be a black man in this country, but as a Latino man, it really worries me when people see me constantly assuming things about me and how I am. So although I could never truly relate, I am here for support and prayers for any affected by the events that transpired these few months and want to take, see our nation take one step back to take two forward. Now, more than ever is the time for everyone to act on our mission statement of working for a world that is harmonious, just, and merciful. Countless injustices and social issues have recently come to the forefront following George Floyd's death. People are angry, and rightfully so people are also keeping silent. I hear and I see my fellow classmates who are signing petitions, donating when possible, and educating themselves. While doing so, remember that this is not the time for performative activism. To my peers who are keeping silent, who are voiced negativity against the Black Lives Matter movement, this is not a trend. And this is not a politically charged movement. There are no differing opinions about the matter of human rights. Salve Regina is a primarily white institution, and I find it disheartening some of you do not realize your privilege. I implore every single person to be a loud, unapologetic voice against racism and violence towards Black people. Chosen ignorance is dangerous and harmful, especially towards our own community members personally affected. This is all of us against racism, and the momentum of the Black Lives Matter movement needs to continue until permanent changes are made to stop the marginalization of the Black community. I personally commit to learning, listening, and taking a stand by practicing my civic duties. Engagement and dialogue need to continue until change is made, and it needs to continue well after changes within the system. To write a paragraph on everything going on in the world would not do justice. It won't do justice to the topic, to the events occurring in our country, justice to my friends, or justice to the Black community. What is happening right now should frustrate, enrage, be a problem to everyone, not just Black people. As a minority, not only at Salve, but in America, my struggles will never equate to the Black community. But I, alongside many others, will be here to help you. Please educate yourselves. Educate others. Correct your friends, family, strangers, whoever, when they are in the wrong. This is a human rights issue. All lives won't matter until black lives matter. I want to be honest. My four years at Salve as a female of color were not easy. And as much as I hate to say it, yours probably won't be either. It will be tough 
at times painful and in the end extremely exhausting but i hope in all the negativity and issues that salve may have and present you with you are able to find recognize and appreciate the beauty and power in its hidden gems that i did find your allies find your safe spaces find your community i promise they are plentiful and will not disappoint they will lift and protect your voices they will bring you comfort and be your support systems these gems gave me hope they made me feel heard, loved, and important. Your life matters. Your presence at Salve matters. In fact, it is deeply needed. Please know that you are loved, and please remember to love one another now more than ever. Be kind, but stay strong and unapologetically Black. Hold Salve to more than thoughts and prayers. Demand action. I stand with you. And I stand with all of these courageous students who submitted these heartfelt reflections. I now turn to my esteemed friend and colleague, Sami Nassim. Thank you, Robin. I am in too much pain that I feel numb and frustrated. So many lives has been taken from us on a regular basis, and our society just sits and watches. Every day, every week, every month, there is a new victim in our black communities and other communities of color. Enough is enough. I am just a human being who can no longer bear the continuous pain and suffering of my brothers and sisters in our communities of color and our black communities. I am participating on this forum today not to ask for sympathy or for people to feel pity for our communities of color. I'm here to ask for our communities, God-given rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. For this to happen, really change must occur in our nation and in our campus. Not just the usual empty promises after each time of those hateful crimes take place. Real change requires real commitment that is followed by action. Commitment without action means absolutely nothing. It's even worse than lack of commitment. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, I'm going to share with you, with all of you, some of the questions that were sent by our Salve community members, faculty, students, and staff. Those, those questions, we're not looking for answers for them right now, because I, I don't believe that this is the right format. We have to be in person. But what we need is to reflect on those questions. And we all expect not just the answers to those questions, but real solutions in the near future. Many of those questions are challenging and so provoking, but need needed to be heard and acted on. It's a time for all of us on our Salvis campus, student, faculty, and staff. Not just to, to, to stop just talking the talk, but also walk the walk. Here are those questions in no particular orders. 
What is Salve's long-lasting plan to create an anti-racist institution? There needs to be training and workshops for staff and faculty, not just the student leaders. This has been an occurring request from a student of color. When will leadership make workshop training a policy at Salve? We need to improve already existing diversity training to include anti-racist workshops. When teachers include racism and diversity in their lesson plans, they need to rework how they teach. It's not enough to mention it once. If they are including race, they must delve into it. What is a concrete list of classes that Salve offers relating to diversity? We need to make an effort to use more books by black authors in our English courses. Another question. As a part of our Mercy mission and community service, we should be donating funds and our time to anti-racist organization in Rhode Island. We need to hire black professors. I know there is a spot open in the ADJ program. Have we made an effort to diversify the faculty? We only have one woman and the rest are all white men. We must expand our counseling services. And I recommend looking into black men How is the admission team goes about investigating racist act, racist acts from current student and the prospective students? It would be very empowering to see our dear school taking a stand and defending our small but growing minority demographics. It would just be interesting to hear a little bit detail about how, how the process works so that we can understand better. What is Salve doing to educate faculty on how to address the current events that is happening worldwide? What if Salvi is going to do faculty who uses their discipline as a platform for racism under the false pretense of initiating thought-provoking discussion in the classroom? Again, we are not looking for answers to those questions right now but we will be expecting not just the answer, but the real solution to them in the near future. It's a time for all of us to really walk the walk. For the final component for our forum today, I am going to hand it to our beloved president, Dr. Kelly Armstrong, to share Salvi's statement of solidarity and a call to action. Thank you so much, Sammy. Can you hear me? Um, I am very grateful to all of you for being in this space together today with particular thanks to our students, 
faculty and staff who have generously shared their hearts with us during this difficult time. We are witnessing these events with heavy hearts as we think of the people who have been lost, of the senseless violence, and what these events have laid bare about the state of racism in our society. As individuals, many of us feel a deep frustration and pain because it is hard to know what to do to affect real change when these issues are so entrenched. What we can do is effect real change in our own community here at Salve Regina. We can make a difference here. We are a Catholic mercy institution that stands for particular values, and we are an educational institution. We have a special obligation to provide an environment for our students, faculty, and staff that is safe and secure, where all members are respected and heard, and where our values are woven into the fabric of all of our educational experiences. In the classroom, in our co-curricular environments, in the workplace. At Salve, we measure our success by the positive impact that our students have on the world. And the best way to ensure that they will have an impact is in the care that we give to the educational experience that we provide for them. As a new member of this community, I know that I'm walking into a conversation that has been happening on this campus for quite some time and that thoughtful work from the Multicultural Advisory Committee, the Racial Diversity Initiative of the SGA and other efforts have recommended concrete steps to move Salve closer to the inclusive community that we aspire to be. Today, I'd like to talk about some immediate next steps we will take at Salve based on what I've learned from this earlier work. We will take further steps that I will mention here today than, than what I will mention here today. But as I know you are aware, because we are in the middle of this pandemic, we are facing some unusual limitations, but there are steps we can implement right away. First, as we heard from, from Izzy, we need to openly acknowledge and define the university's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. A more explicit statement of these values will be de developed and communicated. We will implement a training process for all members of our community to participate in that will give us a common vocabulary and understanding around issues related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, so that we will have a foundation for deeper conversations on this campus. We need a particular emphasis on training of those who are in high impact roles, such as our, our, our resident assistants and our faculty, to ensure that they are best prepared to support an inclusive environment for all of our students. I will be launching a leadership development, development program for our faculty and staff. And in this program, we will be providing training for so that we are better able to support students and staff from diverse backgrounds. This program will also emphasize how to leverage the power of diversity in our organization. And although we had planned this for the past spring, but it was upended by the pandemic, we will launch an annual equity and inclusion summit for our whole community, which will provide the best thinking and practices to implement improvements in our environment. I know that there has been a lot of discussion around the addressing changes to our core curriculum. I am committed to working with faculty to make sure our values are reflected in our curriculum, and I know they are committed to this as well. Our strategic compass exercise earlier this year asked us to define what every Salve student needs to know by the time they graduate. I know from looking at early results of the strategic compass work, which our whole community contributed to, that diversity and inclusion were prominent in those results. We will see this reflected in the final version of the strategic, the strategic compass and in our curriculum. We will institute changes in our hiring processes, including how we recruit and how we select future members of our community to ensure that we are doing everything in our power to bring in a workforce that reflects the diverse backgrounds of our society. We will implement a regular campus-wide climate survey for our students, faculty, and staff 
so that we will have an ongoing measure of the effectiveness of all the changes that I've mentioned and future changes. I know that we have had some excellent efforts to measure climate in the past, but we need this to be institutionalized as a regular practice so that we can monitor all of our progress on these fronts. And to continue this conversation over the summer, we are creating an online forum for our community focused on racial justice that will be launched shortly. This is just a beginning, but you have my solemn commitment to continually work for change and to do everything in my power to ensure that our campus is a safe and secure place for all. We will work together to build an educational environment that is worthy of our mission as we send our graduates out into the world to make a positive difference. Thank you so much to all of you for being here today. And I turn it over to Teresa ladrigan Webley for our closing prayer. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. And thank you to every member of our community who has shared today in word and um, in the um, messages shared um, with others that we have heard here today. Thank you for entering into this prayer, this deep listening, and this commitment with all of us. For our closing prayer, God of our ancestors, God of our neighbors, God with us. You are the source of our human dignity. It is in your image that we are created. Pour out on us your spirit of love and compassion. Enable us to reverence each person to share the resources of our communities and university, to value diversity of gifts offered to us. Grant that we may promote justice and practices of mercy in our hearts, in our institution. Help us redress systematic racism, systemic racial injustice through transformative practices in our community and transformative practices of nonviolence. Help us remember that we are one world, one salve community. Amen. Thank you for joining us all today for this vigil and forum for racial justice. We have listened. We have prayed, we have committed, and we must act. Thank you.